Tradesmen built America. Not policymakers or desk jockeys, but hardworking blue collared men and women. Join me, Roger Wakefield, on conversations with some of the nation's most successful skilled laborers. This is the Trade Talks. Did you ever think when you were in high school you would get to build some of the coolest cars in the world? Didn't have a clue. Never thought about it at all. Cars were just a hobby. Grew up around it when my dad was racing. Thought, you know, maybe someday I'd have my own race car. Was probably going to follow in the family footsteps of being a teacher, educator. Yeah. Back at that time. And then, uh, you know, 40 years later, plus. <laughs> yeah, plus. Yeah. And stuff, so. No, wait, you just told me you're 39, so how, yeah, well, how'd you figure all that out? I don't know. It just, it's that Garland math. Yeah, boy, and that's the truth. <laughs> so, a hobby. Mm -hmm. What kind of a hobby was it back then? What were you just little, building race cars? No. So my dad was drag racing when I was born. Okay. So I grew up around drag racing. That's what I wanted to do as a hobby. I wanted to have a race car. And then economics, dad quit racing. I was playing sports, you know. So he had less time to do it. Plus his, his career was getting more involved, teaching and stuff like that. That's what he did. After that, you know, it's one of those things I wanted to to have a race car, but I knew that economically it would have to just be a hobby. I mean, whatever. So he ended up selling his race car and then decided he wanted to build a hot rod, an old Studebaker pickup. I don't know if you remember that or not. Mm -hmm. He still has that. 47 years ago that we built that truck. Wow. So in high school, I wanted to build one for myself to drive. I was a freshman in high school. So we built our first building to, uh, have a room to play with our own toys as we called it and so we did that and never thought of it ever becoming a business it's just it's bought my, my very first car i ever bought was a 1934 chevrolet two-door sedan and i was going to build that as a hot rod maybe drive it to school on occasion or whatever just go to car shows random things like that and then in high school i got a job working in a poultry shop doing a uh, because of when my dad had his truck upholstered, I was going to Bussy Elementary School or junior high. Mm -hmm. So I'd make my mom, when she'd pick me up every day after high school or football practice, let's go by and look at dad's truck. I wanted to see how the interior's going. So then I got offered a job at 14, 13, 14 years old, I guess it was, for the summers to come sweep floors in a poultry shop. So I thought, okay, well, I can make some money to buy parts for my car. So I started doing that and started building the car a little bit here and there. Well, word got out going to the car shows that we did, cruise nights we called them, stuff like that, local hamburger stuff, Keller's, some of those other places. Oh, you got a shop. So they'd say to my dad or something like that, well, can y'all weld this? Can you do that? You know, I need to get this bracket made or I'm having problems with this and I don't know how to fix it. Well, not that we necessarily knew about it any better than anybody else, but, well, sure, you know, we thought, well, we can do that, make a little money and buy some equipment to work on our own cars. So we built that first building in 1980. Basically, it was to store a uh, $1,500 riding lawnmower to mow a 10-acre. There you go. There you so go. our CP mom and dad's CPA told them, you can't keep justifying that anymore like that. You, he said, you're doing some work for other people. He said, get a register with the state, come up with a company name, and then you can start depreciating your equipment off, stuff like that. So 1982, graduate high school. We do that that summer. Three years later, we had more than double our square footage of building. <laughs> so we started off with 2,400 square foot. Yeah, 2,400 square foot. And then we added another 40 by 75 Three years later, 10 years after that, we added another 2,000 square foot. Back in 2017, we just added another 2,500 square foot. just keep foot. growing. And we're in the works right now. We just got some final approval from the city. We're fixing to build another 6,000 square foot building, mainly for storage, because we have nine storage units rented to store stuff in when we disassemble a car. Uh, 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 uh. So that's kind of the quick cliff note version of, of where we got to where we were 
you know, is, is so how many hot rods have you had since then? Since high schools? That's what you wanted to start out with. For my personal ones? Uh-huh. Um, well, I ended up selling that 34 Chevy. And then and while I was in the midst of going to college, just because we got busy working on other people's stuff, my stuff got put on the back burner. And uh, I had an old Chevy truck that I was driving when I would go to college. So I have worked on that. Kind of a hot rod, but it's also a daily driver. And then I never really had one of my own till just a few years ago. It's one that we built for a customer about 15 years ago, and he passed away. And it was one of our favorite vehicles, so we bought it back from the family. And the car was, I'd say, 13, 14 years old. It had 1,200 miles on it when we bought it. Wow. Never. So I've been putting miles on it. I drove it to middle of Kansas last May uh, for a weekend, for a one-day Saturday car show. I left on Friday, drove up there, came back on Sunday. Uh, a couple of weeks from now, I'm going to another one in Austin, Texas, in it. This video is sponsored by Leak Pro. Go check out leak-pro.com. I do have another vehicle of my own that I've been working on. Also, it's a 62 Chevy 2 station wagon. Now, it's kind of a hot rod it's kind of all rusty patina looking uh -huh. but it's got a twin turbocharged ls engine in it and i did a three years ago i did uh the hot rod it's called the hot rod power tour so it's kind of a traveling car show and it starts in one city of the united states and each day you're in a different city so i did three thousand miles in seven days wow in that car and loved every minute of it did it yeah. by myself so. That's cool. So, I mean, look, most people, we go to school, we, we get out, either a job comes along or we do a little research and find out what we want to be when we grow up, and you just take a hobby and turn it into a career. It wasn't my intent. <laughs> so I went to college, took the seven-year plan to get my four-year degree. There you go. Teaching. Um, like I said, my dad was a teacher. My mother was a teacher. And... Uh, I thought, well, I'll do education. I'll have weekends off, have the summers off, keep the car stuff as a hobby. You bet. Yeah. So I still got my degree. Um, sitting at the dinner table as that was going on, that time part, that part of my life, getting ready to graduate college, and you know, parents asked me, so "What are you gonna do? Where are you gonna teach? You know, what are you looking at? Where are you looking at going?" And I just told them, I said, "Look." After listening to y'all complain about administration here for oh, yeah. at dinner, we're busy enough at the shop. I'd like to try to make a go with that. I got the education to fall back on if it doesn't work. That was May of 1980. Well, I guess I graduated in college in about 87. So somewhere in May of 87. So it was only a five-year plan, not too uh, bad. Well, in that range. Maybe it, yeah, somewhere in there. <laughs> But it took me longer to get it than it should have. And I was yeah. working. We were, like I said, uh, so in the beginning while I was going to college and Dad was teaching, we were open six days a week, 8 a.m. till 10 p.m., and then Saturdays 9 to 4. And we did that for 10 years. Mm. And we did that because at the time he taught Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. So I took my full load of classes usually on Tuesdays and Thursdays and did that each semester. So that part of why it took you know a couple of classes i just didn't do what i wanted in them so i had to take them over and it took a little bit longer to get it done just that dedication of doing that is kind of where we are now so what did dad teach at that time he taught horticulture at richland college uh here in the dallas area he uh was the department head um that's what brought us to texas originally we were originally we were migrant oklahomans and that's you know don't hold that against man me. But we moved to Texas. This uh, video's over. He took he he took the show or took the job teaching in 1974. Cool. He taught there for 35 years, retired, and then was offered at Eastfield in their automotive program uh, teaching over there. They needed they were shorthanded, and all those junior college teachers kind of know each other. There's what seven, eight, I think eight or nine campuses within the Dallas. You speak it's Dallas County Com Community College District now. So there's like seven or eight campuses, and they all know each other. So they called him up and said, hey, we're shorthanded. Can you come teach for us this semester? So he did that in the beginning. In the meantime, was writing 
his own curriculum, got it approved by the state, and the school district built a building at Eastfield College just for building. He started a uh, custom hot rod program. That's pretty cool. And got it approved, taught that for 10, 11 years there, and then finally retired at the age of 78, and he's he'll be 84 this year. First of all, tell everybody who you are and what you do. So my name is Mike Millsap. I uh, grew up here in the Garland, Saxe area where we're at, and um, I guess on paper I'm considered owner now of Saxe Rod Shop Incorporated. Um, my f- mother and father and I started it as, like we were just talking, as a never intended to be a business, and it turned itself into a f- full-time business. God, I've known you, what, since probably 79, 80. I was at a conference, and, and actually I think, I think it was a, a training for instructors for the union. It's been a few years back. And, you know, you, you go around the room and everybody stands up and says, you know, I'm Roger Wakefield. I'm from yada, yada, yada. I said, I'm from Saxe, Texas. And this, and literally somebody across the room says, you ever heard of the Saxe Rod Shop? Yeah. I'm like, well, yeah. And they're like, really? It's like, we've been around a while. Um, when I was, when I graduated high school and was still working at the shop, I didn't take college classes in the summers because we were busy. Well, we have a family friend uh, out of Oklahoma City that had a business sem- that catered to the retail side of the hot rod world, selling parts, and traveled to national events. And uh, that summer I graduated, he said, hey, I need to help at one of my shows. Would you do that? And I said, sure. So I started doing that every couple of weeks, plus working at the shop. Well, I got to know all these companies and manufacturers. I was just a kid. Well, you get to knowing these guys, and some of these are brand new companies just starting up. You get to talking to them. Well, hey, you know, my dad and I do some work on this stuff. Can I, you know, maybe what's their you know, dealer program? What's it going to take to maybe buy some parts? Now that there's some of these companies that are this major, major companies, manufacturers in our industry, and we're some where Saxe Rod Shop is actually several of these companies' oldest dealer now. We've been selling some of the parts for these companies since 1982. Okay, so first of all, what trade do you think you're in? Are you in like paint and body? Are you in well automotive mechanics, engine rebuilding, or all the above? All the above. I'm sure you've seen some of these television shows. Oh yeah. So yes, we're in the auto. We do at our shop. We do we're what we call a full service, full build shop. So we'll do small repair work. If you just need that done, we're not a general mechanic shop. I don't go in, I don't get into rebuilding an engine. But if you want an engine put, a new engine put in your 69 Camaro and you want it fuel injected with aftermarket AC and, you know, full ex- stainless steel exhaust, yeah, we'll do that. But if you just wanted somebody to take the old engine out and go through it and put new rings and bearings and stuff like we're not in that business. There's mechanic shops out there. You bet. But, but Paint and body. I do personally all the upholstery and have been. That's kind of my forte. But in the beginning, when it was just my dad and I, and I did some of the small paint and body work that we did. Uh, cut glass. I can cut glass. Uh, chassis fabrication, TIG welding, wire welding, whatever we needed to do. Uh, we do it all. You know, we wire vehicles. Uh, we One of our biggest deals is this coming up this time of year is we do a lot of AC installs. Fixing to get warm. Yes, we got four lined up right now. The components are sitting there in our showroom floor waiting for us to have an empty space to get the car in to do it. Uh, We got 17 cars in our shop right now with probably, I would say, close to a two-year waiting list. Maybe Mm. What we started doing, because in the beginning, you learn as you go. You know, we've been doing this a while. We got to talk to other shops. So people call up and say, hey, I want to get on your list to get some work done. Okay, we just write their name down and phone number. Well, then... Six months down the road, you call them, oh, I don't have that car anymore or whatever. So what we started doing, we do a $1,000 deposit to get on a waiting list, for, especially if it's major work. And that's still your money, but it's kind of a good faith deal. And it lets us know that if you back, if something comes up in your world and you need to not have the work done, I'm the first person you're going to call because you want your $1,000 back. Right. We give it back to you. Currently, we've got 12 or 13 of those on a waiting <laughs> list right now. Plus the jobs that we have in the shop. And out of those 16 or 17 cars that are in there, over half of those are what we call total builds. So they're two- to three-year projects. Mm. 
It's not for the faint at heart. Oh, yeah. Or the ones with shallow pockets. Oh, yeah. And, I, and I'm not trying to be funny about that. It's just it's the industry has gotten that way. And a lot of that has become uh, because of social media, mm-hmm. television, the shows. Some the majority of, of it. It's huge. It, it's same in your industry. Uh, the Some of the shows have been bad for our industry in, our, in some ways, over-inflating. It looks, you know, I call it over-inflating what's being done. Uh, we get a lot of this. Car, some of the cars in our shop right now are what we call auction cars. There's shops around the country that throw junk together, make it look pretty, kind of like putting lipstick on a pig, run it through the auction because you get all these high-dollar very wealthy guys that get to these auctions and want to be on TV and they you bet. they're drinking, they want to spend a lot of money and they spend way more than they need to on these cars. And we've got some cars in our shop that the guys couldn't even drive them out of the car, out of the uh, auction from mm. the auction. And, you know, it's, that's bad. It yeah, gives it's... the industry in a lot of ways bad reputation, but not all shops are that way. There's more good shops than there are bad shops well w- wouldn't you think and I- i'm thinking of Mitchell. you know wouldn't you think that they'd be like hey we want to make sure it starts make sure it runs make sure it does this or are they just in it for and nothing bad about them but is that, it, well that's the business so of course i've never here i am talking about it and i've actually physically never been to an auction but right. i have all these customers that spend a lot of money hundreds of thousands of dollars on a car and i'm like why didn't you like here it right well we're not allowed to you know we can't see it you know, what we can see Standing outside the vehicle is what we can judge it by. But supposedly they are required to drive into the building or whatever, but not all of them do that. Mm. And it's it's obvious that the ones that are what I call auction cars. Yeah. You know what I mean? But then there's some of these cars that are selling for half a million dollars, and it probably took a million dollars to build it, just the industries that way. We get customers sometimes that want to build a car for an investment and we tell them to go put their money in the stock market. They'll actually make more money. Crazy. It, it is. It's not an investment. It's to it, do it for a hobby. Do it because you love it. Right. You know, that's what you want to do. So so what does somebody on an average spend? I, I've got a 2014 Jeep out there. If I said, okay, look, I, I want a, a cool looking leather interior. I want a Corvette race engine in it. It's already jacked up. I want, I want, you know, Turn my Jeep into a monster. Well, that's a little out of my world, but just by going, kind of comparing, paralleling the two, mm-hmm. the two industries, because that's a four-wheel drive world, and I'm not familiar with some of the stuff, but just to give you a deal, like a brand new GM crate engine okay. that we're putting in a car right now with the transmission right at 20 grand. That's just those two items. You still got to fabricate the price. Purchase price okay. from Chevrolet. Okay, you bet. You still got to put it in a vehicle, and it's an aftermarket crate engine. Depending on the vehicle, you may have to fabricate mounts, Modify. transmission, cross members, exhaust. It's also going to be fuel injected for the most part, so you got to do all that plumbing and wiring related to that. And um, so you get into that interiors. Um, I'm doing an interior in a car right now that just the leather alone was $12,000 just for the 10 hides, 12 hides that I bought. Wow. Well, so, yeah, it'll be, by the time it's all said and done, it'll be 50. Get it, everything in the interiors, one-off hand bait, custom LED lighting, you know, all the panels are hand fabricated to look like something you'd see in a 3D movie. That interior guessing will be fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 by the time it's all said and done when you figure labor guessing carpet alone was twelve hundred dollars or thirteen hundred dollars just for the carpet then i said i've cut it and fit it and put it in a car prep the car to even accept it uh, uh, paint uh, jobs um custom paint depending on the color you can't buy the paint what will and so this is kind of not deceiving but so when people talk about a paint job well, you got your primers, your body fillers, sandpaper. That's part of the cost of the you job. Bet. You, bet. you got to calculate those into the cost of the job. But just the chemical, the paint, and the reducers and the hardeners and the clear coat, depending on the color, you may end up spending five, $600 a gallon mm. just for that. And then the other com- components to, to mix with it, you bet. put it on the vehicle. 
So paint jobs, we tell people right now, our paint jobs start at about 30 grand. <laughs> you know? You're, you you're not Mako, are you? No. <laughs> and and we but, but you're going to see the difference. Yes. I mean, uh, we got a guy that pays for us. He's been with us for probably going on 18, 19 years, maybe longer, maybe 20. And I'll put his quality of work up against anybody in the country. And he paints basically in a barn. I love it. I love it. That's one of the reasons we're looking to do a new building is maybe to spread things out a little bit eventually where he can, the area that he's been working in can stay more dedicated for that and not have to body work in it and then clean it. Like I said, it was never intended to be a business. <laughs> it just kind of morphed into it. It has. You got to love that though. Okay. So somebody out there is listening right now and they're like, oh my God, I'd love to do that when I grow up. You're talking paint and body. You're talking mechanic. Mm-hmm. You're, 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 basic, you're, yeah. you're, you're talking upholstery, which is a, a complete trade and in it's itself. So, and so each, actually, you know, they are actually every one of them. You, you, you bet. You look at somebody like you and you've kind of compiled it all together. And I'm sure you're not out doing the paint and body and all not that. Not anymore. Right. Right. But, but when it was you and your dad, you did. Mm-hmm. So you kind of learned all of it. And I learned it trial and error. You know, okay. You make mistakes and you learn. Well, I didn't go to school for it. Yeah, you know, there's several colleges, and my dad himself has been on some of the advisory councils for some of these tech schools that just cater to our industry. Uh, Wild Tech was one of them uh, that years ago, uh, they couple of the t- instructors branched off and started their own called the Hot Rod Institute. Both of those are actually up in North Dakota or South Dakota, I guess, Sioux Falls area, mm-hmm. up in that area. And they have one of the best diesel mechanic schools at that at Wild Tech also in the country. So if somebody wanted to, if somebody's big into the four wheel drive diesel truck stuff and they wanted to become a diesel mechanic and be good at it, I'd recommend they check into that program. There's other smaller ones around the country, but they have a very well known, nationally known program. Uh, same with their hot rod program, and they teach paint and body at that program. They teach upholstery. Um, general mechanics, you know, uh, fabricating, fab- uh, f- metal fabrication skills, uh, electrical, wiring, stuff like that. Uh, if you wanted to get into doing automotive restoration, taking old cars and putting them back original, like they came from the factory in the 30s and 20s and teens or whatever, um, probably that best school in the country is in, get this right, because I always get in trouble for saying the town wrong. It's, it's in McPherson, Kansas. It's at McPherson College. It's a four-year college campus that has probably the best program in the country for automotive restoration. Wow. Uh, they teach you how to take a flat piece of metal and make a fender for a 32 Ford type deal from hammer and dolly and English wheels, stuff like that. They teach upholstery. They teach machining, like how to actually remachine an engine and turn the crankshaft and bore the block. They actually offer all of that at that program, their program. Mm. And that's the school where I'm going. That's where the car show is I'm going to in May, driving the, probably drive the 32 Ford Roadster if I don't get the station wagon back together. Kind of took a neighbor for a ride in it and melted a piston. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been working on getting a new motor for it. Uh, but yeah, those, so those, so somebody's wanting to get into this trade. Uh, it's young kid out of high school, you bet, whatever. They need to look into those programs. They're out there. Um, a lot of shops will, well, I want to just go to work for somebody to sweep floors. Well, what's going to happen is they're going to get stuck sweeping floors, maybe being an extra set of hands on occasion, but they're not going to get, they're going to get visual firsthand experience, but they're not going to get hands-on experience. Mm-hmm. And shops would rather hire somebody that at least went through the program because they're going to have, they're going to have some beginning welding skills uh, if that's the direction they're going, they're going to have um, beginning paint and body skills if they're wanting to, you know, go lean more towards that direction. Uh, we have a young kid that works for us in the summers right now. He's actually a student at McPherson. This video is sponsored by Leak Pro. Go check out leak-pro.com. Son of a friend of ours that worked for us, the Gary worked for us when he was in high school at Garland, sweeping our floors and doing whatever we needed many years ago. Well, his son now works for us in the summers because well, the, the program requires their students to do an internship somewhere in the country. 
And uh, he called one his first semester there and said, um, can I come to work for y'all for the summer? I have to intern somewhere. And I said, well, sure, because I knew him, you know. Mm-hmm. So he came to work first week there. We kind of just did a couple of days or whatever. And I said, so what part of the industry or program that you're going through do you like the most? Do you like upholstery? you like mechanic, paint and body? He said, well, believe it or not, they also teach marketing and social media <laughs> and part of it. So like, bingo, your job this summer is to come up with us a YouTube channel and start doing our... You've like, had somebody telling you that for a while. You need Yeah, to, yeah. I'm, I'm saying, he said, not going to mention any names or anything. And we have a limited content. But dude, isn't that the truth? At, at our shop. But as you well know, because now it's your career, mm-hmm. it's a full-time job. To Absolutely. Do that. That, that is a full-time job. So when I'm helping trying to take care of a business, uh, my parents are getting older, so they're less and less. We've got some really awesome guys. i got one guy that's been with us 25 years. He runs our show, our uh, sales counter, purchasing, inventory, all that. One of the probably smartest guys in the country in this industry. Not only knows the parts by part number, but he knows how to use them. He's a hands-on guy himself. Mm-hmm. With doing that, that's one of the reasons I never had one going on. It's just too much to try to do. I'd film it, take pictures, stuff like that. Then I didn't know what to do with it. Didn't have the time to, yep. to l- learn it. So he did that his first some summer with us. And then the next, and of course, when he went back to school, everything kind of fell off a little you bit. Bet. He's graduating this year, this May. So it looks like he's going to come back at least full time till he decides he wants to do something else. Mm-hmm. And another student there who's interested in the upholstery side of it, I hit him up and asked if he would be interested in interning with us because I could just use the help. I'm spread pretty thin. You bet. Uh, it takes me too long to get anything done uh, type deal. So, yeah, that's how that that's how our YouTube channel came. We've got probably 130, 145, 10-minute videos out there, and he does the reels. And so now I've learned, and he taught me into getting a more up-to-date phone. Mm-hmm. It takes better pictures. Better you don't have your flip phone anymore? No, I got rid of that a couple <laughs> months ago. Uh, so I'll take pictures or quick video if a new car's coming in, of it coming in off a wrecker or unloading it off a trailer or whatever. And I'll send those to him. He'll do just a quick reel just to keep our profile going on social exactly. media. But that's that's a full-time job in itself mm-hmm. right there. And, and honestly, that's a, a whole different trade, M- marketing, social media. I never would have thought 30 years ago that that would have even been a possibility. Uh-huh. I'd have never thought it for me, for plumbing, for, for the plumbing industry at all. Oh, I remember seeing some of your videos when you were still, you yourself were still doing plumbing. You bet. You were doing your little how-tos or mm-hmm. educational videos, I called them, for your homeowners. Absolutely. And, you know, you got the gift to gab, so he, you were able to turn it into the It just kind of turned out and worked. To livelihood. Yeah, you know, hey, but, but look, it's neat that you're doing that because... Mm. No, number one, it's it's going to help you grow. It's going to help your awareness grow. You know, not that people aren't already aware of you, but now they get to see what you do. It it does, and it it has increased the phone calls. Not that we needed it. I mean, we get well, you well, just you're building another building, so right? You know, it's on the average market. right now, uh, five days a week. I would say at least three days a week we get phone calls wanting to get work done. I mean, sometimes two or three a day. Mm-hmm. And for um, most people, that, they'd be like a plumbing company. They'd be like that wouldn't that could never work. But when you're talking a project that's a two or three year project, that's what, what, what's your average cost per customer? Have you figured that out yet? Well, it's kind of hard to do that, but I'll just do it this way on a total build. Mm-hmm. Let's just say you found an old. 67 Chevy pickup out in a pasture and wanted it totally customized, like full till. You bet. You're going to have over a hundred grand just in parts, depending Jeez. on your, depending on your personality and your choices. Oh, you're you're not my personality. But I'm just saying, you, you, you can, you can have that kind of, you know, there again, a motor and transmission is 20 grand. You bet. If you decide to put a complete aftermarket framing under it, which we do that on a lot of cars because it's faster and cheaper in the long run. Mm-hmm. 25 to 40 grand, depending on the options, just on that frame. So now you got a rolling frame and a motor and transmission that you can bolt together, and you're at 60 grand right there, but you still got 
everything else go on the vehicle wheels tires dry shaft exhaust wiring yeah, fuels. yeah when you say rolling frame that, that's not a nice set of wheels no that's just wheels that turn yeah yeah so the reality of it is now it's 100 grand in parts for the most part wow and then labor our labor rate is pretty modest for our area we there are shops in our area that are 10 15 20 dollars an hour higher than us and there's shops that are the smaller shops with less employees or newer, younger shops, they're less money. Eventually, they'll figure out they're going to have to increase because doing the work's the easy part mm -hmm. if you're going to be in a hot rod business. Doing the fabrication, cutting and welding, that's the easy part. It, it the hard part of what you're doing. The hard part is knowing how to run the business. You can't be in business if you can't don't know how to run a business. And it is. It's a business. So there's a lot of shops that start up. You know, We've seen them come and go in our area. There's a lot of people that, oh, I can do that. They'll, they got a toolbox and a shop or a garage at home. Yeah. They think they can do it. And, and they can. They can do the work. But there's more to it than just being able to physically do the labor, you know, if you're going to be in business. You got to know how to how to run the business, how to – I'm no, no, no. I guess I do it so often, it's just I don't even think right. about it's it. That's what you do. But, you know, and we also have uh, – for years we did – and we still do. We have a retail showroom, but we we used to travel ourselves as a small business to some of the shows, car sh the national events, and set up and sell parts uh, as a vendor. And we had a you know two hundred plus page catalog that we actually would do everything for that catalog in house, but physically print it. Our guy uh, Mike, that's been on our sales counter, his when he first came to work for us, the very first fourteen months he was on our payroll was to design and develop and get our new catalog done. So he spent four, roughly 14 months writing every bit of text, figuring out all the part numbers that we wanted to put in it, taking every single picture, doing all the page layouts, and we went to a printer, and it was you know half-inch thick printed catalog, one of the nicest catalogs I've ever seen. Wow. And we did that for years. Well, then just the world's changed to where you can't afford to print a catalog, you know, 10,000 catalogs were costing us 50 grand, you know. Absolutely. Uh, and you're giving them out for free. And that's part of that learning that business, you know. Uh, well, nowadays, your, your digital guy coming in can take that catalog, create it electronically, and send it out to everybody in the world. Well, we're, we, we have it on our website. We have a website also, and it has uh, pictures of, like, completed cars and cars that are in progress and, that's one of the things he does is he keeps that updated when he's there. Right now, what I do is I take pictures of all the work going on on my phone, and I've learned through teenagers teaching me how to operate a phone to separate everything out into folders mm -hmm. in my photo gallery. Good, good for you because I don't do that. Oh. And So now if I'm dealing with a particular customer's car or I need to talk to a customer about how we did something on a car like his, well, I can go through and pull that other customer's work up and say, okay, this is how we did it. And I got record of it. It's easier to find. Mm -hmm. I don't, cause I got 16,000 pictures on my phone right now. Oh yeah. I'll... If I had to go through all of those to find one picture, it'd be crazy. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how we do it. You know, stuff like that. Um, I'm looking forward to this new building. Our shop is very crowded. It's been a long time since you've been there, but you can tell that there's work being done in our shop right now. It's not hospital clean, uh, it's 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 a paint and body shop. Well, well it, yeah. more than that. It's but, more than that, but it's it's just a shop. There's you know we got five six total bills going on. You know it's crazy, and anywhere from two hundred and fifty three hundred thousand dollar cars to one of them will be probably close to a half million dollar, and not because we're so expensive, because what the customers want and what, how he wants the car built is taking that to get done. So from this being a hobby in high school. To becoming, man, one of the premier hot rod shops around the country. What makes you want to become that good? There's a lot of kids out of high school that look. I, I want to do paint and body, or I want to be a plumber. I want to be an electrician. Whatever it is, there's very few of them that come out and say, "Look, I want to be really, really good at this." So, growing up, when we were starting to do this, even when I was doing it before we had the business, my dad's attitude is the job is always as the job is only as good as the part you can't see. So, like when I'm doing So a, there ain't no auction cars rolling out of your shop? No, no. <laughs> There's a whole lot you can't see there. We, we Exactly. When I'm doing interior work, I'll make the backside of the paint. A lot of 
I, we get cars in, have to pull the interior out of them, and I look at how they're made. A lot of shops just use old school cardboard like we did back in the 70s when I was in high school working in it at a poster shop or plywood or plant paneling. They use that, uh, which it works. Not Nothing wrong with it. Uh, keeps the cost down. But um, it just won't last. I use aluminum. All my panels are done in aluminum. I can think it's metal. I can take that aluminum and I can take the material off of it a hundred times and put reupholster it a hundred times. Mm -hmm. And that le that ma aluminum panel is going to stay intact. If you did that with cardboard, once you glue to it and you start peeling the card material off or, or plant paneling, yeah. uh, humidity affects cardboard panels. It affects some of the wood panels. Uh, there again, to get to your question, what makes you want to be as good as anybody, well, you always want to be better than the next guy because your car is competing with, the, that you built is competing with some other shops at some other at the same shows. So you want your customer to be proud, and they're paying you good money you to have a good job. If the backside of that upholstery panel is the edge of the material is trimmed, so what I, you know, I'll take a piece of three-quarter inch masking tape because that's a given ruler, three-quarters of an inch, mm -hmm. and I'll run it around the edge of the panel, and then I'll trim off the material to that edge. So the backside, the material is a nice, clean, straight edge. You do that on everything and fit it, and it, it just makes the overall job finish nicer. When we do paint and body work on a car, a lot of shops will paint the outside of the car and the door jams, but then they just kind of let it overspray into the behind the door panel. We paint it because when that door panel comes off, then you got a finished painted door, you know, type deal. Uh, we don't sand it and buff it in the areas you can't get to or see. Right. But we, it's painted, and it also acts as a sealer, keeps the car from wanting to surface. Because primer itself is not a sealer. The paint's the sealer. You know, if you just see a car riding around in primer, eventually it's going to start rusting mm -hmm. type of deal. So that's just it. You know, you want to be, and, and I'm always learning. I mean, I've been doing this for a living for 42 years, and I'm still learning. Like, I go to, uh, there's some companies that just do some trade schools kind of like weekend learning how to do something mm -hmm. and i go to those when i can uh for myself to learn how to improve myself at the job that i've been doing for 40 years because there's younger guys out there that have better sense of use of technology mm -hmm. technology has really stepped the game up just in the upholstery world there's guys out there that are doing 3d printing of panels 3d cnc routering of, of stuff and and covering it Stuff that I didn't, I mean, I've seen it coming up, but I'm like, shit, you know, excuse my language. Oh, you're good. But, you know, I wish I'd have stayed with, stayed with that technology after I graduated college because that's what my degree was in, was in industrial arts. You know, I took drafting in college, but it was three-dimensional three drafting wasn't even out there. 3D drawing wasn't even available right. yet. So, you know. Technology has changed and it has stepped our game up. So these younger people coming up that are into that kind of stuff, but like old cars, there's some big bucks that can be made in that if you get good at it. And these schools are teaching that now. So a kid comes out of high school and he he wants to be Mike Millsap when he grows up. He's hurting. <laughs> Man, I tell you, 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 number one, y'all you, got a great reputation nationwide. You, you know that. Knock on wood, we do. You, you, I'm proud, you, and I'm bet. proud. Of, I'm proud of what we've accomplished. I oh, really am. Look, when, when you mention the name of the town you live in, and somebody says, "Wait, you have you ever heard of the Saxy Rod Shop?" It's like, well, yeah. We, we got hot rod shops. One of our biggest customers on the retail side of our parts side of it is a hot rod shop in in Australia. They send us a big inventory order about every two months because it's easier for them to get it through us and what one of the things that we do that they're going to want to order parts that we don't that we're not even a dealer for right but it's on their list we take the time to get it for them we put them a big old package together uh another hot rod shop just bought a frame from us because we're a dealer of this particular company in in uh sweden you know it's a forty thousand dollar frame that we sold to a hot rod shop that, in Sweden. And when those guys come to the United States for their holiday, so these companies come, make it. Oh, yeah. We're, we're, we we're coming had, to Saxe, Texas. We just had some uh, customers from Australia that were on vacation. They're hot rodders in their country. Been here for six weeks just traveling around. They landed in 
California and rented a vehicle. And one of their stops they wanted to come was to Saxe Rod Shop. So that's a pretty good feeling when you got people that want to do that. Uh, and we've been around long enough. And like I said, we're the oldest dealer for several of these manufacturers that have if I'd have saw the industry, if I knew could tell the future 40 years ago, I think we would have gone into manufacturing instead hmm. of the hot rod building. It's a lot easier. Well, you know, you still got a few years higher, left. Higher profit margin. <laughs> it's a lot easier to deal with. In profit margin, an, an amazing thing. Yeah. It's your shop now. Yours and your dad's. But, but well, as I mean, long as he's still around, it's you, his. you bet. No, and I get that. What kind of money can somebody make? I mean, if and not just your shop, but... So, so, so we we kind of keep up. I kind of keep up with that because I know some of the other shop owners, not okay. just in our area, but you know, there's shops around there. There's guys in this industry that are making sixty bucks an hour, fifty bucks. You know, fifty, sixty bucks an hour is a. He has to be extremely good, very good, like some of the best out there. But a guy can make seventy thousand to a hundred thousand a year, depending on the area mm-hmm. that you're living in and uh, and how good your 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 ability is, you know, you, you got more experience and none of your work has to come back and nobody has to babysit you. You can make more money. Um, a lot of that's relative to the shop's, uh, hourly rate. Right. I mean, you, you bet. So for years as a small mom and pop business, uh, we're, we have like nine employees up. We're up to nine employees now, not including my parents. They're not on the payroll, but so at one time, we put, we were very competitive na- nationally with our pay, always have been, but we also paid a hundred percent of their health insurance for a small mom and pop you company. Bet. You bet. That, that's you know, and now, unfortunately, health insurance has gotten to where we it's can't afford crazy. to do that. We still have it and offer it, but we just we as a business can't afford to pay a hundred percent of it. They have to pay some of it now. Yep. And that's part of that business side of it. You know, there's a lot of shops out there in this industry that that's just not even. You know, you don't show up to work, you don't get paid. You know, there's no insurance or whatever. We offer a 401k. And all this comes from the fact that when my dad was teaching horticulture and stuff, he taught landscape maintenance and management and Mm -hmm. business management. Uh, My mom also taught office education and economics and stuff in high school. So having that background growing up, that's part of why we offer that because you're also going to get a better quality employee if you have some of those benefits and stuff, we give them uh like, I don't know, pay a week's pay, I guess full week's paid vacation, uh, five, six days. Uh, if they, any of those days they don't use at the end of the year, we'll buy it back from them. So that's kind of an incentive to you never bet. call in sick. Absolutely. We've never had to do that since we've offered it. Everybody runs out of time or well, something, yeah. something comes up, but this is part of being in, in business. Uh, having employees, as you well know, is can be a headache. It can be. Um, it's a great thing when it's going good. Um, you never know when who's going to show up, <laughs> if they're all going to show up or if they're all not going to show up. Yeah. But that's just part of it. That's just part of life too, you know. But that's somebody that's wanting to go into the industry or into that business, any of them, they have to think about all that. You know, that's really part of the trade. Learning how I can, I can glue two pieces of PVC together and, you know, water runs downhill. I understand that. But running a plumbing business and buying your inventory and what you need and what how to do that. A little bit that, different. It's a little bit different. My world's a little different than yours, but they're the same principle. You To be successful in business, you're going to have to know how to run a business. Mm-hmm. And I would take and suggest anybody that's wanting to get into it, young kid or whatever, get as much of the background and basics as you can through a tech school or something like that, but take some business classes too. Because if you're an employee, if I'm hiring you as an employee and you understand the economics of this business and how we can, what you need to do to help us make money, that makes you a better employee. That also makes you a little bit worth more on the pay scale because you're not going to be sitting there riding the clock. You know, you're just not. Oh, yeah. You're going to understand that's not good. Right. Say dad pulls completely out of the business. And I know he's still around. It's. It's there. He's there every morning at 530. Once he quit showing up at 530, is there anything you change? Anything you say, look, I'd really like to take it this way or I'd really like to do that. Or are you already doing it? Except for the social media part. You, you're you're getting on board. Yeah. 
that would be the neat thing. Um, I don't know if I would change anything. I mean, he's kind of hard headed. I mean, he he's old school. No, I get it. I mean, him, ain't nothing wrong with that. They they basically grew up as sharecroppers in Oklahoma, you know. So they're very conservative people. We've been in business forty two years. I'm just now working on trying to get a business line of credit. So all the growth that we have done for all these years, we've waited till we had the money set aside to do it. You, you may want to hang around at 2 o'clock. I've got a meeting with the company about that exact thing. I literally, I was in a conference last week, and if you're in the trades business, any business at all, you need a business line of credit. And he's literally talking about how to do it step by step. And he's like, in a year, I can take you from zero line of credit to you can get millions of dollars in loans. And it's it's neat to listen to him go through the process of how he does it. And, I mean, it's literally like, where do you buy your gas from? What gas card do you use? Don't use these because 97% don't report commercial. 3% do. You better be buying from those 3%. And, man, it's, 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 a, it's, it's business education mm -hmm. that we all need that yes. most of us don't even know about. It's like, well, why would I need business credit? My personal credit is fine. Yep, but what about when you just bought a house? Now you need something for what? Well, it's something I learned, and I don't know if you ran through this too. So technically I'm self-employed, but I have always been an employee of Saxe Rod Shop mm -hmm. for several reasons. If I wanted to go buy a house and I'm self-employed, well, you got to, it's a harder deal to get a loan. Open your tail up because I got to telescope up to look for If I had a W two form, you bet. Where I was getting a paycheck, yep. So then I can take that to the bank, and I, you know, just to do a home personal, a uh, home equity loan on myself on my home. Uh, it's a lot of work. Yes, it is. Yes. So I'm like, well, wait a minute, because I this is how I learned this several years ago. They knew that I, the bank I went to. We've been banking there forever, so they kind of knew that my name was on. Well, we need this, we need that. We, they wanted all these documents mm -hmm. and all this proof of all this, and I'm like, well, can I just? And after weeks of going back and forth, I'm like, well, can we just do this off my W two form? And they're like, what do you mean your W two? I said, well, I'm an employee, and I get paid a paycheck every week in a W two at the end of the year. I said. I would rather do it that way if at all possible, not rely it, you bet. not tie it into the business. Oh, well, yeah, there was no problem. Yeah. But that's a five minute deal. But learning all of that and knowing what's going on is a big step in learning. It was just, it blew me away. They wanted all this information. I'm like, I'm not trying to borrow against the business. I'm just trying to, you know, so you got to learn all that. And that's this guy that sounds like you have coming up would be something worth it. Man, Some, everybody needs to watch. It, Even the young people just yes. doing it because they're all. If if a young kid's in, interested in hot rods, they the dream is to always want to do it. Probably, absolutely. And then there's more to it than just being able to weld or yeah, put shiny yeah. paint on. Yeah, it. I'm I'm gonna bend the metal a funny way. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot more to it than that. Well, it was really neat because in this guy's presentation, he talks about what, once they had his business set up. He said he literally walked on the car lot and he's like, you know, I want this car, I want this, I want this. And they said, okay, I'll get you to fill out all this. He says, no, no, no. He says, I want, I want to get it on my EIN, which is what you use for your for your business line of credit. And they're like, yeah, there's look, there's a lot of there's a lot of hoops that that I have to clear and yada 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 and and that's just sometimes hard to do. They said, look, just run it. They ran it. Said you're approved. No signature, no nothing. There you go. Thank you. Have a great day. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and I'm kind of conservative growing up, you know, as it was my background. So I, I've been very cautious because I don't understand a lot of that and what mm -hmm. can and can't do. I don't want to take the chance of putting my business in jeopardy after all these years. You bet. So, so I got to I got to get myself educated on it. But we're working with our bank that we've been dealing with for well, even before we went in business, you know, years ago. It's the same bank. So we're working on that, but I'm learning a lot doing it, and I'm going to probably listen. I won't be here at 2 o'clock because i got to get I, back. I, I'll be able to tell you so about it later. Work for yeah. you. I know. Well, you know. I'm working. I'm working on my business. <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and that's one thing, too. You know, my first coach was Michael Gerber. He wrote the E-Myth books. And, and the E-Myth book, it's it's not the way you got into business, but most of us, you know, we worked for plumbing companies for so many years, and we look back at all this money we've made them. You know, look, I, I mean, I've ran $20 million jobs. You say, okay, you should be able to do about 10% profit. Y'all y'all made $2 million profit. Man, well, why, why didn't I make 
good money like that. The interesting thing about it is Michael Gerber talks about you're either working in your business or you're working on your business. Mm -hmm. Today I'm working on my business. So sometimes it's in it, sometimes it's on it, but you got to do one or the other and learning new things. Even the business line of credit, I didn't even understand that until last week, week and a half ago. Mm -hmm. But I do understand your personal bank may not be the one to help you get. And that's what we're, that's why we're, yeah. we just started this process in the last week or so. And we're starting it today. And so, so it. you know, I'm learning and they may, like you said, they, they may not be who we end up going with. Yep. Or the op the direction that we go, but we're still trying to learn that. Any more growth plans after this next building? You already looking at the next one? No, this will be far enough. I'm old enough now. I just need to get to where we can be more, maybe more efficient. That's what I'm hoping it'll do. Because you know, like I said, when you got nine, when you got components for cars that are disassembled. Across like town, out of space. Uh, across town, yeah. a storage unit, and you have to. Okay, I need I need that front fender to make sure that all this is going to fit and clear. So now I got to stop what I'm doing, get in a truck, drive over there, remember what storage unit we put it in, which we keep up with that. But and then load it up, come back, and then you can go back to work. So now you've lost thirty, forty five minutes doing all that. That's not efficient. Yeah. So if we have that ability there on site, now we can just walk. 300 feet, 200 feet, and get it and have it right there and keep going. Um, but as far as more growth, not necessarily. Uh, maybe another employee or two once we have the room and space. Uh, you know, I get a lot of shelving off the floor that's currently taken up work area mm -hmm. and put in this storage. Plan on doing an overhead mezzanine in it to put stuff that just sits a lot up out of the way, and then I can still put cars because uh, one in our industry right now one of the biggest things that we've since covid for the most part is we end up having to wait on parts a lot of times i have to keep at least two cars per employee try to keep going so if we're working on this car right now we get to a part where we got to wait on the part apart he's got another car you bet you know try to plan ahead on that job so that's what we like that's why we have all these ac jobs lined up right now is one of the guys came in and put his deposit down this past summer, not this past summer, towards the end of the year. Um, put his job deal down. We looked at his car and figured out what he needed. So let's, we'll go ahead and get it on order. We'll get the parts in, and then as soon as I can get an empty hole, we'll get your car in. But the parts are here waiting for us. So because that's our, nice. in the AC, there, during COVID, it got to us taking 26 weeks to get an AC system. Which we used to get them in three days prior to COVID. Wow. And now they're back to a week, week and a half. They've caught up that much. The company that we use has caught up that much. But then there's some companies, uh, the company that manufactures uh, aftermarket steering columns that we use a lot of. If we ordered one right now for a 69 Camaro, a specific combination, it may be 10 weeks before we get it. Mm -hmm. They're that far behind. So, and you never know what you're going to need. In our industry, because I, I got a big variety of cars in the shop right now, and nothing, and we never do the same thing twice. We kind of build a car to the customer's personality. You bet. And uh, you know, we've got '54 Cadillac convertible, we've got a '72 Chevy pickup, we've got a '66 Mustang, '60 a '73 Mustang convertible, a '70 Torino, a '56 Chevy, '55 Chevy, a '40 Ford pickup. 49 Chevy pickup, a 57 Chevy pickup. You know, those are just the ones I can think of off the top of my head. A 56 Lincoln Continental Mark II, very rare car. We got one of those in our that. Here's a good example of what we get into. Customer came to us two and a half years ago wanting us to do the this Lincoln. And we said, well, at that time, it was about a year and a half, two-year waiting list. He said, well, I don't want to wait. So... He takes his car to another shop in our in the North Texas area, and it was in that shop for a while, and I guess he got unhappy with it there, so it left there and went to another shop to finish. Well, now it's in our shop to fix everything that the two first shops didn't do because he didn't want to wait on it. 
And so it ends up in our shop to start with, and now he's going to spend a lot of money. And this customer is 90 years old. Mm. He is 90 years old. He gets around as good as my 83-year-old dad does. But he knows what he wants. He knows what he wants. And he told my dad the other day, he was out visiting, coming out to see his car, and so he said, I should have just waited. I should have just waited. I yeah, got, he, he, he would have all done it, by now. He would have got it quicker. And because one of the things that we do on a total build, I won't let the customers have them until I've put at least 500 to 1,000 miles of drive time on it. Because, good example, we left, we sent a car, total build, 57 Chevy. The owner was in uh, Hobbs, New Mexico. So he flew in a couple of times to see the project while we were working on it. But if I'd have just finished that car and let it go home without troubleshooting it or debugging it, because mm-hmm. it's a new car, it's all hand-assembled hand, hand parts, you're going to have issues. And if I'd have let it go home and he first time he got in it to drive it and heard a rattle, heard a rattle or hold this or that, he's unhappy and he's 1,200 miles away. So then he's got to look at finding somebody to fix it there or bringing it back. And uh, he's a car dealer, so the car's set in his showroom floors for, for, he's had it for six months. He just drove it two weeks ago for the first time, and he called and was bragging on how happy he was with the car. So not, not just how it turned out, but how it drove, how it handled, how it performed, uh, how the AC worked on it, how it was just everything. And that's a good feeling, too. You bet. I mean, we do pretty decent work you know we're not necessarily the cream of the crop but we're not on the bottom of the pile but we build a nice car and i do make sure that they're quality piece before we let it go out the door well when you're nationally recognized for what you do that's not a bad thing I guess. and for the positive end not the not the bad end well we, we can't please everybody it, not, we have an nobody answer. can and i'll be the first to admit it you know I'll even give them the customer's name, and they can call and talk to them one-on-one if they want to you know, question what, what that customer didn't like. You can't please everybody. You bet. Um, we do have a style, I guess, that we like to kind of work around, and sometimes the customers want something that you just know is not going to work, and you, you have to try to edit. That's You're not into those Hot Wheels rebuilds or anything? No. no. It, yeah. probably, probably one of the hardest things in our job is educating the customer. Yeah. Because they see what they see on TV and it just in per, from personal experience, 40 years of you doing it for myself and doing it for multiple other customers, you just know what does and doesn't work. So is there a need for mechanics, upholstery people, paint and body, all of it, Any anything in the automotive industry? Is there a need for it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's... Are y'all hurting for people to... Well... You, you, you're you you're in the elite level, so it's hard to say, yeah, I need 10 more so mechanics. You, well, you have... So like, let's just take paint and body work. So all of our work is custom. We're not a crash shop. So we're not working on your... What is your truck? A Chevy? My Jeep. My Chevy. Chevy. Yeah, Chevy. either one. Yeah. So we're not working on a dealership level, which, right. not, you know, that work has to be good. You bet. But we're not taking a dented fender off and putting a new fender on. Um, we're taking a 32 Ford and changing the door handles and shaving the door handle, taking, changing the latches, modifying, putting the, gold wings on it or whatever. You bet. Suicide in the doors is a big thing. So yes, there is a need for it, but there's a need for it. Like on the paint side, somebody that at every level, at every level, I mean, who's going to work on your daily driver in 20 years if they don't keep teaching them you how bet. to do it? You know, it's a it's a it's a trade. You know, it's a hands on trade. Electrical. Um, who's going to wire your houses or our buildings if they don't keep teaching mm-hmm. that trade? Because my dad's generation, you know, th- like when we first started building hot rods, there's a couple of tires: a street rod, hot rod, traditional, whatever. That's just a style. But the street rod industry or hot rod industry, as I call it catered to pre-48 vehicles, 1948 and older. And the generation of folks that built those cars were my dad's generation. Well, those 80-year-old guys aren't building new cars anymore. <laughs> so now the generation of people that we're building cars for, honestly, are dot-com guys that are in their 40s. You know, we have... They customers. got money to buy toys. They got the money. Uh, so that alone is 
you need a you need a group of people that are learning that trade because yeah, there's people my age, your age, we're not going to keep doing it forever. Mm-hmm. Who's going to come up behind us if they're not being taught how to do upholstery? That is probably one of the hardest. I've been looking for a good quality, high end custom upholstery guy for a while um, to come in and take the take the load off. I'll still do it, but I could have a full time guy doing it. We've got out of the cars in our shop, I got nine interior jobs that are coming up in the works in the next over the next year and a half of total bills that we're building. I can't do nine interiors in a year and a half, two years. I just physically can't. Yeah. Um, but trying to find somebody that's learning that, you know, there's guys out there that can redo a seat cover for a sh- truck. And nowadays, you buy a cover and you just put it on. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, for what's on my trucks for the for the late model industry, yeah. crash industry. That's kind of how it goes. But to take a three dimensional drawing of some space age interior and produce that, not everybody can do that. And the guys that are good in that industry, that are really good, have their own business, and they're in the same. Yeah. Business. A friend of mine that, well, the guy that, when I worked in high school at the poster shop I worked at, the guy that was the general manager there, or the manager there, he has his own shop in, in Mesquite, and we talk pretty, we stayed in touch over the years. I sub some stuff out to him, and he's helped me. I've helped him. But he's having a hard time, too. He can't find people that want to work. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people that want a paycheck, but they don't want to work. Oh, yeah. Oh, I so, see it every day. And then, so, because they're the guys that you don't really want because they're not, they're not doing things to improve their ability each day. Uh, I got one guy that works for me right now, and I can tell that on the weekends or at night, he's looking at vehicles. He's studying. You he's bet. Study. He he's wants learning. to get better. He's exactly. Everybody in any trade, I don't care if you are in the social media side, the paint and body, the, the mechanic side, if you're not looking and learning, trying to get better, the whole world's going to pass you by. Exactly. And to... My industry is not a needed. I'm very fortunate. Right. You're not a necessity industry. Where, yeah, you yeah. don't have to have your hot rod to get to work every you day. Bet. You would like to have your toilets flushing every day. It's a nice thing. So that's another thing is my industry is a hobby industry. There is a need for it, and we're hurting for people, good quality people. And it's a big, it's a multi-billion dollar a year industry. SEMA is one of the biggest trade shows in the, in the world. It's unbelievable. I can only imagine what, like, your industry is, which is... No, it's cool. nuts. It's so nuts. So learn a trade also. You know, think about it. If you're... If, if you like cars, but you are good at electricity, maybe do electrical for your livelihood. You bet. And then keep... Is, but, yeah, who's going to do it? Who's learn, gonna, learn to do it for cars on the side and say, hey, look. Trade schools, Votex schools need to get back... The industry, the schools need to start promoting that again because I agree. it's not all about the computers. We still got to have that, but people need to have, learn how to work with their hands mm-hmm. and stuff. So again, tell people who you are, where you're at. How can they get in touch with you if you know that they've they've got a hoop tee sitting out in the garage and Grandpa's nineteen forty two somethings there? And I'm Mike Millsap. Grew up here in Saxe. Co-owner, I guess I want to say right now because he's still around uh, of Saxy Rod Shop. Enjoy him while he's around. Yeah, exactly. I, I, the motorcycle show, the Tuttles that was out there yeah. for years. Yeah. We, he and I get along like that a lot of times. You bet. I'm thankful every day that he's there. So Mike Millsap, Saxy Rod Shop. Uh, we have a YouTube channel called the Rod Shop Channel, and uh, you can look up Saxy Rod Shop on that YouTube also. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have Facebook, and um, I think there's an Instagram account on there also uh, that we do. Call us. Just call or tell us, you know, or come visit us. We we give what we call the nickel tour. We'd like to do that on Saturdays, if at all possible, so it doesn't disturb work environment. But uh, we're open 9 to 1 on Saturdays now. It's kind of what we call show and tell for the customers. The current customers that we have like to come out on Saturdays and see their progress on their projects or something like that. We have a 1-800 number. If you're out of state, you can give us a call. It's 1-800-495-3904, which is our address. I have to, I don't call that number very often. There you go. But uh, the YouTube channels, uh, the Rod Shop channel, Saxy Rod Shop, and then Facebook. I don't good know deals. Else. No, it's good. This is kind of 
well, new for me. Well, one thing I'd tell you, start taking your, your social media guy mm -hmm. to the shows with you. We do. And his job is to follow you around and video you looking, talking, you're wired, mic'd up, stuff like yeah. that. We, and we do. So some a lot of the videos that we've done when we work on a car, like when I take it out for the first test drive and talk about cool stuff. all yep. the work that we've done on it and uh, I'll notice a problem. I actually talk about it. You know, some of the, one of this, this interior job I've done, one of our films, I had to cover one piece three times. Well, I'm still not happy with that one piece, so yeah. I'm going to recover it. And I talked about that. Why, you know, just we're not perfect. You're going to have problems. You're going to have mistakes. Uh, screw something up. You get distracted and you come back. And, oh, I did it. I, yeah. That's not how I was going to do it. Didn't so, want that to look that way. A lot. And that happens a lot. So, yeah, we are we try to be real. Uh, I don't want it to turn into this TV show where everything is perfect. We've actually turned down one of those, uh, op the opportunity for that years ago. Um, but probably because we didn't understand what it was all about. Of course, yeah. now hindsight, you see, but it's kind of a dog and pony show. It is. Uh, it is. Type deal. So we're more about building the quality car. I like that. There's and stuff. So you got to have that other side of it to help keep mm -hmm. it going. You, you really do. You do. And I'm learning that. I uh, so if you could go back now to the day that little Mikey walks out of the house the first day after graduating, first day after, let's, let's go to college. No, let's go back, high school. You're going to go to college for a little bit. You're going to come to the rod shop. If you could go back and talk to little Mikey now the day he walks out of high school, the morning after, he's getting up, getting ready to go to college, getting ready to do the rest of his career. What would you tell him now? You know, everything you know now, what would you go back and tell him? Pay a little more attention at certain things when I was going to college, certain classes. Algebra was a hard class for me. Took me three times to get through it. I'm not ever going to use algebra building old cars. That was my mindset. Use it every day. You just don't think that it, you don't know that it's algebra that you're using. When, when I'm on the milling machine and I've got to figure out an angle to machine a hole or a uh, drill a hole to get it to come out where I want it. In a roundabout way, it's algebra. And same when I'm doing upholstery panels. If I'm trying to blend two angles together to make them come out right or calculating material thicknesses and stuff like that. It's, and then there's the business side of it, just economics. Pay attention in that class because, you know, well, my mother, she's done our uh, books and counting forever, and she's done it the old school way. Where we did, she has a spreadsheet on a computer and a handwritten ledger book for every customer, yeah. every transaction. But the world's not that way anymore. So keep up with what's going on, you know, or learn it. Be be open for new exp new opportunities. And I didn't do that through the years. So now that I'm being forced into that situation, I'm actually been thinking about going back to school at night just to pick up on to get myself better at that because. I guess the, most of the industry uses QuickBooks. Most CPAs like mm -hmm. to use that. Well, it really doesn't cater to, they don't have a dedicated deal to a custom automotive. I get it, just try to get it. But had I paid attention in class, I would have probably learned better or had a better understanding of how to adapt it to my, to my needs. So I'm having to learn that now. So, yeah, it just, yeah, th those things, I mean, would I have done everything different? Probably not, honestly, but I would have paid attention a little bit more. Maybe drank a little less <laughs> Saturday night <laughs> Saturday night activities. Absolutely. And, and but I'm I'm thankful for what I've done and kinda happy about it, you know, proud of it. It's and like I said, it's a hobby business. So to have survived in our industry as long as we have and to the level that we are still, um, that's that's a pretty good feat. You've done pretty well. Yeah. This has been fun. Thanks, I, I appreciate it. I'm glad you had me uh, finally convince me to come do it. <laughs> and one of these days, if you need um, to do uh, something to just show more about what goes on, not necessarily my industry, but just cover some bases, bring your, your audience by the shop someday. Sounds good, man. We'll give you the nickel tour. I love it. And talk about it. Appreciate right. it. Thank you, brother. All right. <laughs>